All right. So today we have Pam Bennett. Uh, many of you probably know Pam. Pam is an extraordinary extension person. That's the title I'm going to give you today. Um, she, <laughs> she is an associate professor and state master gardener volunteer program director with the Ohio State University. She's also the interim Chadwick Arboretum program director. She's a horticulture educator. And as a, Pat and I, Pam and I were talking earlier, I think that she and I, and many of you can relate to the last little title there, crazy plant woman who can't say no. <laughs> so, or for those of you guys, a uh, crazy plant guy who can't say no. <laughs> um, so Pam's going to speak to us today about fundraising and reputation and why these things are important to consider with your mission and vision of your Master Gardener Volunteer Program and give us some guidance on that. So as we go through, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we can address them. Um, or if you want to unmute yourself and ask questions as we go, that's fine too. Uh, this session is being recorded, so we'll send the link out after the webinar and we'll also post it on YouTube. So thanks everyone for being here. Uh, Pam, if you're ready, you could take it away. All right, Nicole, thank you for the uh, very generous inter introduction. And uh, we are crazy plant people and we don't say no simply because we absolutely love our job and extension. Uh, it's hard not to like the kind of work that we get to do, plus the fact that we get to work with Master Gardener volunteers. So today, this is gonna be a discussion. I'm not doing a lecture or, I mean, I do have a bit of a presentation, but it's gonna be a case study. It's going to be a discussion. It's going to be feedback coming from you and kind of a back and forth chat about this. Um, but it's also um, not research based and it's not based on science. Um, maybe there's some science involved in it. Maybe there's some research that I haven't looked up to discover, but this is all based on experience today. And I'm going to share with you via a case study uh, and then putting it all together and how you can um, successfully raise funds and maintain credibility and, and uh, reliability in your program area and your reputation. So in the chat box, yes or no, are these items related? Fundraising, mission statements, credibility, reputation. Okay, I should see all yeses. There should not be any no's. Um, and if there's no, well, we're gonna discuss why no is not the right answer. So the next question is, how are these related? Can you tell me how they're related in the chat box? Hmm. Depend on each other? Trust, require people. Without one, you can't get to the next. Good, good. One impacts the others, requires focus. Great, these are all great comments because these are gonna lead right into this presentation for today. Nicole says they help with community and program support, link your mission values, link to the overall organization. So we're gonna talk about this and how these are related. But like I said, first of all, I'm gonna give you a little story, a background, uh, a case study about my program area um, and when I started an extension and how we got to where we are today and why credibility, reputation, fundraising, and the mission statements are all very important to us. So I started my extension career back in 1992. I was an extension educator in two counties and I came back to one county and I firmly believed and I still be, be, believe today and that's why COVID has been really hard on many of us. Uh, Hands-on learning is the best way to teach people about horticulture. So at our old extension office, we developed the Gateway Learning Gardens, which was basically um, a five acre, let's say demonstration garden. We were in a corporate park, which was okay, but it wasn't the best and most conducive for a public garden. We had trucks coming up and down. We had big vents and fans next door at the company beside us. Uh, but we were a small building made to look big that the county commissioners put there for us to have our, all of the ag offices in one building. So at this garden, we started to develop our displays and our demonstrations in order to do hands-on teaching. And in the center there, you see a couple large trees. Unfortunately, those were calorie pear trees that uh, were the first two trees in the Clark County area to actually show fruits. And I can remember to this day walking out of my office of that back door and looking at those calorie pears and saying, what is that? Is that a fruit? And therein began the saga of the invasive calorie pear species. 
Um, but around that area behind the building, we had a real nice, um, very formal garden. Down the left side, those are my field trials, which are my is my research project, cultivar trials. Um, and we continue to expand this. We added a children's garden. We added an early Ohio settlers garden. We started our first victory garden, which was our garden that we actually pro, uh, raised produce and donated to the food banks, which now, of course, many of you are collecting that information uh, for our national report. Then we went along and said, well, let's do some perennial displays. So we created three big beds in the backyard area for like a perennial garden. We work with a lot of community organizations, um, the community, local community school, the um, technical school rather. They came to our site and built this barn for us for storage. And of course, like any other organization, we quickly filled that. So we developed these five acres into a really nice demonstration garden. We actually then after about, I'd say eight years, we decided, you know, we've got quite a mishmash or a quilt of a patchwork quilt of design here. We need something to kind of design so that, you know, we had a, a, a logical path, go this way, go this way, and to move people through the gardens. So we worked on a design, we raised some money and paid a landscape con ar architect rather to come in and help us with that design. Throughout those years, I started getting involved in community projects. And I want you to, to mark this in your mind because this is really important and crucial to this conversation we're gonna have today. I was involved in Keep Clark County Beautiful. I took the Leadership Academy classes. Uh, I got involved in Kiwanis and Rotary, not as a member, but speaking to their organizations, making connections with them, because as we know, all these service clubs around the communities are always asking for speakers. I jumped in and raised my hand when they said, hey, would you be interested in being a part of the Springfield uh, Strategic Plan? Our city went through and did a, a real nice comprehensive strategic plan. There were five major areas that the community wanted to see. One was jobs, of course, and some other uh, expansion and community development. But two of those were Parks and Green Space Committee and the City Entrance Committee. And getting involved in those made perfect sense with my job because of the fact that we're horticulture. We're the ones helping beautify the community and the parks and green spaces. I also, after Leadership, Leadership Academy, started joining uh, some boards. I stuck my toe in the water with the, uh, the Abilities Connection, was my first board to serve on, and since then I've been able to join several other boards as well. The Ohio Heritage Garden was an, an excellent board to be part of because that was a state board, a statewide project at the governor's residence, and that put me in contact with the governor and first lady. And that really came into play one year when we had severe budget cuts. I was actually able to sit down with the first lady, talk to her and say, you know, Mrs. Strickland, if you could talk to your husband and, and tell him how valuable extension is, because she knows extension, um, whether it did any good or not, we did not get the massive cut, 12% cut that we were supposed to get. We got a much smaller cut. So being on that statewide board also was very valuable. So I started getting involved. And at that time, your volunteers look at you and, and are thinking, another meeting, another meeting, is that all you do? And you look at your schedule and you say, another meeting, another meeting, is that all I'm doing right now? I feel like I'm spinning my wheels. But as I said, keep this slide in mind because this is gonna come back in the end and uh, I will share with you how well this slide and these activities have served me um, in this fundraising process. In 2012, our county commissioners decided that they needed to get rid of that building that we were located in. There were all kinds of different reasons why. And they said, okay, so we're gonna move you and um, we have an opportunity then to move your gardens. And so, you know, as you can imagine, that was really traumatic for all of us. We'd had 12 years worth of gardens developed and realized that we were gonna have to move these. Well, by being part of the Parks and Green Space Committee, I had an inside track on one of our local city parks was gonna be closing a golf course because it was losing money. They were subsidized, the city was subsidizing every round at the tune of $9 a round. So they thought, you know, let's see if the extension master gardeners want to move their garden to this golf course. So we all jumped at the chance. It is in a park-like setting. It's in the park actually. The golf course is a, an old golf course that was, um, established I think back in the 1920s and it was given to the city to be used as green space in perpetuity. 
So there were a whole lot of things happening for us that said, you know, we'd be crazy not to jump at this. It was 83 acres. And of course, 83 acres, when I mentioned this to volunteers, they were like, uh, what? <laughs> we're going from five acres and you want us to do what? Well, our plan, and one of our volunteers put this very succinctly and it was just perfect. She said, think of this picture on your iPhone of our gardens, our five acres, and then just do this and spread it out and open it up and add all that space in between all these gardens. So basically our idea was to take what we had at our old site, open it up and add walking space and green space in between this. So we weren't going to be managing 83 acres. We cut it down to around 53 acres. But again, we have smaller gardens within that 53 acres with lots of green space and lots of walking space. So we spent significant time, um, our volunteers were intimately involved in this process. And those of you who have worked with volunteers and know what design by committee is like, I'm sure you're, you're shrugging your shoulders or you're shaking your head or you're shuddering or shivering with, with fear because design by committee is a challenge. It took us almost two years to develop a master plan. We're, we're here working with our landscape architect. We walked the ground. We kind of looked at what we thought we could maintain and we decided, you know, the 53 acres would be the area that we would focus our gardens on. And it turned out to be perfect because now we have a partnership with the city, with the, the parks district and another uh, um, garden organization is also uh, doing a garden at the site as well. So it's a really nice kind of a, a multiple community effort with our master gardener volunteers pretty much taking the lead. We did quite a bit of work with our community in terms of having them as part of this. We had two stakeholder meetings. We allowed the community to come in and say, here's what we want. Uh, those were kind of fun. The business community came in and they saw it from a perspective of, hey, this could bring in tourism. This could bring in beds and he heads and beds, overnight hotel stays, dollars. Um, and then our general community saw things like a beer garden, a bocce ball court, a putting green. Uh, one lady wanted it to be a wildlife rehab center. So, you know, when you're brainstorming, you put all these things down and then you go back with your volunteers and we kind of narrowed it down to what we thought we could actually manage. We also work with Wittenberg University students and as many other outside groups as possible to involve them in the planning process as well as the planting, the design, and we're still using them today for a variety of efforts and activities. So this is the overall view of the garden. Um, the golf course, if you start like right up here on this side, there's the clubhouse. This is the 53 acres, which is the land that we are actually going to be maintaining um, along with the parks. The best thing is this partnership is wonderful because they are taking care of the mowing, uh, the big areas. We do the trim mowing, the final mowing, the, you know, the, the delicate mowing around the flower beds. Uh, but they do the majority of the big work such as tree work and mowing for us. And then this unmarked area back here is going to be a natural area or a uh, wildlife area where we'll have meadows, prairies, different um, native plants from Ohio and then pathways as well. We were connected with our community to the point that we had incredible, hu huge, incredible community support pushing this project. Now, as I mentioned, it was also political. So there were some issues. Golfers were very upset that they were closing the golf course. So we had to kind of work through all those processes. But this happens to be in an area of our county that's like right in the middle. It's also connected to many of our bike trails, our bike paths, our walkways, and is considered to be part of a bigger project for our parks and green space. So going back to being on that committee, put me right in the driver's seat when it came to time to say, yeah, we can do this. Uh, we want to be involved in this process. So we started developing our gardens and this is one of the sites, um, or this is one of the, the renderings, the drawing. This is the clubhouse looking out to the pavilion, to our cultivar trial. Um, and I can share more details about the gardens, but that's not what we're here for today. We're here today to talk about that fundraising development credibility and your reputation. So in these gardens, again, we're pretty much deciding what we want to do in terms of um, taking the gardens we used to have, putting them here and maybe adding a few things. 
We started with naming rights for gardens and we now have um, the Demana Family Victory Garden, which is 14,000 square feet, which is where we grow all the produce that goes to our food banks. We have an early Ohio settlers garden where all of the plants in there were around Ohio in 1850s when the state was being settled. Uh, and I, I give credit to these ladies, you know, many of our volunteers are 70 and older. Um, they don't use any chemicals. If, if it wasn't around back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they don't use it. So they don't use Roundup. They don't use any other chemicals. Uh, and they do this garden quite well. And it's a very popular garden among our school groups because it does talk about Ohio history. And boy, there's some really cool old plants in there and they are seed savers. So there's a lot of opportunity for programming with the settler's garden. We have a garden of Eaton, which is our display vegetable garden where we teach people how to grow vegetables. And we focus on a certain vegetable every year. And then we feature that and we have grills and we do cooking demonstrations and how to use these vegetables. And then we have some school groups nearby that walk to the garden. We have a perennial garden in which in the near future, we will be trialing all American selection perennials in this site. We have a turf research plot, which to be honest, you know, doesn't seem like it's quite exciting for people, but it is one of the things that people love when they come. We, we have them take their shoes off and they walk across the turf and figure out which turf they like. And, you know, when they get to that Kentucky bluegrass, at least in our area, it's so soft and you can just hear everybody go, oh, this is the kind I want. But then we also discuss the, the reality of having a Kentucky bluegrass lawn. As I mentioned, my research is cultivar trials and we are also a location for all American selection trials. We are the only location in Ohio for the trials. And then we have done various plantings. So the whole concept for this garden is that near the clubhouse, we have sort of what we call, this was the golf clubhouse, we call a visitor center. Uh, we move out from here and then you see the sidewalks that connect all these garden areas. So near the clubhouse is going to be high maintenance, high impact, lots of plants, lots of flowers. Halfway between is going to be things like, um, not collections, we are not gonna actually do collections, but we're gonna do demonstrations. Like our hydrangeas have 43 different species of hydrangeas or cultivars and species of hydrangeas so people can see what they look like and maybe pick out what they like. So we'll do things like that, but we're not gonna actually do collections. And then as you get to the far back, like I mentioned, the wetland, the prairie grasses and all the kind of passive recreation that people might see. This past spring, we broke ground on a um, pavilion. Hang in there with me because I'm sharing all this information to get to the point that I think um, will bring home this information very clearly. This pavilion uh, took about two years to design, again, designed by committee. It had a couple different iterations. It has now, the sidewalks are completed. It is the feature point from the clubhouse. It's between the clubhouse and our cultivar trials. And it was a pavilion that cost us around $250,000. Now, if you had gone back in 1993 and 94, when we started our old gardens and asked me, do you think you can raise a quarter million dollars? I just said, no, you're crazy. I can do $2,000, $3,000 grants, but there's no way that I can raise that kind of money in a small community. Clark County, 60,000 people. We don't have the luxury of Cuyahoga and Cleveland, all these other big counties that have foundations like some of these other counties do. So if you'd asked me then, I'd have said no way. But through my years of experience and what I've learned along, along the way and what I'm gonna share with you, uh, it can be done and it can be done by any of us. Next year, our plans are for the Springfield Foundation Feature Garden. We have $50,000 in hand where we will be putting between the clubhouse and that pavilion, the feature garden. This will be that high impact, high maintenance, beautiful flower area where we have perennials, trees, shrubs, annual display where it changes seasonally. And uh, that'll be the area that we hope people want to come down and see you know, on a regular basis. We now have a donor who has given us $100,000 to name the Wingert Posse Pavilion. We will be moving the cultivar trials to the west of the Wingert Posse Pavilion so that that is up in the area where again, it's high impact, high feature. We are also working with a landscape designer right now on an entrance garden. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Coral Collier Archway here in a second. Um, but the next phase of our fundraising after the entrance garden is the sidewalks. We want sidewalks to be able to connect all these gardens together. Now, currently they're connected by turf grass and that's great and it works, but we also wanna make sure it's accessible. 
So I just applied for a $93,000 accessibility grant with a local foundation who does have funds for accessibility. Um, and there's a good possibility we might get that for some of the sidewalks around the front display and the Wingert Tossie Pavilion. But the sidewalks are gonna be imperative so that we can move people from garden to garden. This is a Kroll Collier building. This is an old, old, old building in Clark County in Springfield that has a lot of history behind it. Uh, I drove, it happened about a year ago in December when I was driving by on the way back from the garden for a meeting. And I looked at this and I thought, wow, that would be a cool piece to have at the garden. Well, along the same times, a couple of my master gardener volunteers also said the same thing. So I started doing some digging and found out who was doing the um, um, wrecking ball and all the what's excavation, whatever that works called, demolition, and said, hey, is there any way we can get that arch? Well, long story short, it ended up being uh, an article that appeared in the newspaper that we were going to save it. We were going to have to pay for the demolition, but we didn't know how we were going to pay for that and the trucking of those pieces. We just wanted the concrete pieces to be taken to the gardens, to be used at our entrance. Didn't know how we were going to pay for it. We did have a donor's thank you dinner for the Wingert Tossie Pavilion and several other high dollar donors. And one of the donors pulled me aside and said, just let me know what it costs to move that and we'll pay for moving it. Uh, that, again, would never have happened without some of the things I'm going to share with you here in a few minutes. So we moved that. It's now sitting there in our garden area. Our designer is going to be designing that along with some other historical pieces. Uh, it was really important to us to have history of Springfield and Clark County included in this garden. So we have that now. And then that's going to cost more money because we have to have an engineer, of course, to put these pieces not back together, but to put them and design them in the garden. So. That's kind of my case study on how I got from the small five acres to where we are today with 53 acres. And what I would say, if I roughly had to estimate our plans and our phases, we have roughly a $4 million project here um, that is being driven by OSU Extension. So again, a question to you, how are these related? And you said this earlier, without one, you can't get to the next, one impacts the other. I'd like for all of you to take a moment and type in your Master Gardener Volunteer Program's mission statement. What is your mission statement? Type in the chat box, everybody, please. <laughs> First of all, if you have to look it up, it's too long. Mike Maddox, Extension Master Gardener, whoops, whoops, whoops. Program educates, empowers, and supports volunteers to use university research-based information. The UVM Extension Horticulture Resources for Public Partner Projects. We train volunteers to use research-based information. I'm still trying to get our program off the ground. Excellent, that's a good start. Our mission is to support the University of Maryland mission, Extension mission by educating residents about safe, effective, sustainable hort practices. Engaging university trained volunteers to empower and sustain diverse communities, promoting research based urban agriculture and sustainable landscape. Great, outstanding, great mission statements. And, and take some time to read some of the others. Kathleen Reed, sharing knowledge, empowering communities. That is a precise, concise mission statement. And that's another program or presentation that you can do or we can do later on. But I've read recently that many organizations, businesses are ditching the whole big major strategic plan and they're doing like one year, two year, like many strategic plans. They're also looking at their mission statement. And some of you, I want you to just, this is an aside, this is homework for you to do later on. Um, think about your mission and vision statements and is it succinct? If somebody asks you that question to, to what do you do? We provide research-based science information to our community members and have fun doing it. That's, that's a succinct mission statement. And that we are doing this through the venue of our gardens. So your mission statement should be, should be really short and should be really concise. And you should be able to share that with people. But above all, you have to have a mission statement. So if you don't have one, develop one. If you want to tweak it, tweak it. Um, but at least know it and be able to repeat it to somebody who's asking, well, why do you want this money? So there's another component here, fundraising and development. So what is fundraising and what is development? 
all of you have a development office on campus and they're responsible for the act or process or growth of the campus or of the college or of the university of extension of 4-H of master gardeners raising money so that we can grow. So they're professionals and they are a resource that you should know quite well because they're, they're good at it. I was good at fundraising, you know, bake sales, um, plant sales, all those things that we do in our counties as fundraisers, the seeking of financial support for a charity or a cause or other enterprise. We're all doing a variety of fundraisers. But when we get to the level of the type of garden that we are doing, we needed to change from just that mindset of fundraising to a mindset of development long term. And with that comes a lot of responsibility. Um, and I'm still learning today. I don't like asking people for money. It's the last thing I like to do. I can't take, I cannot stand if somebody tells me no, it just, I take it personally. But working with our development officers, they have trained, they have worked with me. They have done a really nice job helping me get to the point where I can say, hey, can I, you know, can I have $5,000? But the reputation and credibility are totally 100% entwined with that fundraising and development because if we had not built the reputation of doing what we say we're going to do at our previous garden and in previous projects and had not had the credibility that when we say we're going to take a grant or five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars we're going to do the work that we say we're going to do so that's why these things are also tightly intertwined and, in and dependent of each other credibility the quality of being trusted and believe in do you have credibility in your community? Do they know if they come to you, you're going to follow through on a program? And if you can't follow through, then discuss why. Does it meet your mission? Does it not meet your mission? If you can't do a project, why not? Does it meet your mission or does it not meet your mission? And your reputation, of course, is the beliefs or opinions that are generally held about someone or something. And for us, it's our Extension Master Gardener volunteers. So as coordinators, if we say we're gonna do something, our credibility and reputation is at stake. Our stakeholders, those who are funding us, those who are donating to us, our community members, those who are partnering with us, collaborating, working with us. Our university is also why, why we need to maintain that credibility uh, and so forth. So there are a lot of different people that we have a reputation and our credibility to uh, continue to uphold. So each of these, as somebody earlier said, they're dependent upon each other. So if you look at the different lines here, you see the mission statement goes directly to fundraising, but it also goes directly to reputation and also goes to credibility, but it's not just one goes to one and then comes back. With my mission statement, if I'm raising funds and I go out there and I have my reputation, I have a positive credibility, I have a project that is wrapped around in the middle, everything's wrapped around that, my fundraising and my development is focused on that mission statement. And as we are doing this project with master gardeners, who many of them have never been involved in this type of fundraising before. Most of them, this is brand new to them. Uh, and they didn't join, and I'm sure you've heard this, this statement before. I didn't join this program to ask for money and raise money. I joined it to, to teach people about gardening or learn about gardening myself. So they're learning this process as we go. But one of the mantras as we are working through this process of this garden and are working through development, and I always use this example, if somebody gives us $5 million for the garden, but attached to that, they say, we want to build a swimming pool. Does that fit our mission? And it's a great example, a great sample of, of, of telling people, look, if it doesn't fit our mission, then we're not gonna take money just because they're donating money. Yeah, would we like five million? Heck yeah, it'd be wonderful. But if that five million doesn't fit our mission for that particular garden, and we have a Michigan mission, Michigan, oh dear, a mission statement for our garden. If it doesn't fit that mission of teaching, research, outreach, the educational components, then it's not something that we're going to accept. So we're not going to take money just for the sake of taking money. Along with that, we're not going to take plants. We're not going to take artwork. We're not going to take all these other things that people now all of a sudden want to give us. Hey, we've got a couple plants if you'd like for the garden. We're not going to take it unless it fits into our mission statement. So again, I rely heavily. When I got into extension, I read Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Uh, I would recommend it even though it's old, it still holds true today. 
And that mission statement is just so valuable to have because when somebody says, can you do this project? If it doesn't fit into our mission statement, we tell them that really isn't our mission. Um, so fundraising development is intertwined with mission. Reputation is intertwined with mission statement. Reputation and credibility go together. Fundraising and credibility go together. Again, if somebody gives me the money, I better spend it doing what I said I was going to do. There are things that come up, like for instance, we have a $12,000 grant right now that is to purchase a golf cart that we can use to take people with disabilities around the garden. Now we haven't bought that golf cart this year. I've got that money. I'm due for a final report here December 1st. My job tomorrow is to call Susie at the Springfield Foundation and tell her, Susie, we didn't buy the golf cart this year because of COVID. I mean, it didn't make sense to buy it and have it set there for a year. We have the money in our account. Do you want us to return the money or can we delay and buy it next spring? So that, that reputation, that credibility, that transparency with our donors to make sure that they understand, you know, we're not gonna just hold on to that money and we're not going to do otherwise with that money than what we said or stated in the grant. In addition, all of these fundraising development, mission statement, reputation, credibility, these are all about our projects. We all have a wide, wide variety of projects that we do in our communities. So I want you to take just a couple minutes here and on a piece of paper at your desk, write down a few of your projects, just a few of them, and run them by your mission statement. Run them by your mission statement. Do they fit within that mission statement or are you experiencing what is called, and another really good book to read is Mission Creep. Are you experiencing mission creep? In other words, that swimming pool, that $5 million, well, maybe we could make that work if we did this, boy, $5 million would be great. Well, let's go ahead and put in a small swimming pool. Well, that, that doesn't work. That's mission creep. When you start to creep over those lines, say, well, we don't usually do that, but eh, we want the money, so we'll do that. You just, you can't do that. You've got to, to stay on mission, stay on target. So take a minute to write down projects and do they fit your mission statement? All right, so if anybody would like to openly share, have you come across any projects? Um, <laughs> Mike, Mike Maddox, I, I can always count on you for a bit of humor. We are in the process of visiting the Mission Chiropractor and to get the program back in alignment with things. Excellent, excellent uh, use of words there, Mike. Um, so anybody wish to unmute and share? some of their projects and their mission statement and where they are in this process. Jean Margaret Birchfield is updating her handbook. Anybody want to share? I guess, I don't know if it's easy. If you can see uh, Nicole, if they want to share, I can't see everybody. Raise your hand if you want to share. Maria, Marissa, you want to go ahead and share? Hi everyone, my name is Marissa and I'm the academic coordinator for volunteer engagement with the University of California Master Gardener program and I'm so excited about this topic because I've just released a tool to my coordinators that's a that's a rubric for sort of evaluating our projects against the mission, the UCA and our strategic initiatives, um, inclusion of communities historically underrepresented in cooperative extension programming and a variety of other criteria including like alignment with um, you know, unique areas of, of interest or brilliance, both of volunteers and coordinators and also academics that our volunteers and coordinators are collaborating with. So um, I'm, I'm excited to see how, how our coordinators are utilizing that tool. And I think in this particular moment where I'm expecting to see some depressed volunteer commitment in the coming program year as a result of COVID-19, sure. um, I conducted a survey that sort of indicated that. I think we are gonna be needing to do less with less. So I wanna make sure that our projects are really um, impactful and, and kind of lining up with um, the mission and, and vision and strategic initiatives um, yeah. that we're saying we're trying to align with. So um, yeah, I'm finding this um, 
this visual that you put together really, really helpful. And, and I, I hope I can um, maybe borrow that in future to kind of explain the why behind um, this kind of assessment of projects. And, and to, be, to be truthful, you know, we might not retire or sunset those projects that aren't, aren't in alignment, but maybe we can be honest about which areas need to be um, improved or elevated or, or focused to ensure that um, the projects are actually doing what we, what we claim we wanna do and what we do wanna do, which is serve all Californians. Great, Marissa. Thank you for your feedback. And two things, Marissa. Number one, uh, the first thing I thought, and Julia Hill said the same thing, can you share that tool? <laughs> so um, Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you familiar you... with our Extension Master Gardener National Resource Repository, Tori? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'll touch base with um, with Missy Gable and find out the best, um, maybe the best location for that. And, and Melissa um, Womack, who's done some some web mapping for the Extension Master Gardener Resources Perfect. page. So I'll get it up to y'all. Perfect, because uh, Sherry Dorn was the chair of it. And now I believe it's going to Terry James, but they're going to be putting out another call for materials. That would be fantastic. And if you could send that to me, I will be sure that, or no, send it to Missy and ask Missy to send it out via the listserv to all coordinators, because I think all of us would like to see that and have it in hand. So that sounds like a great resource. And Absolutely. secondly, I believe you are the one that I copied off your survey. Uh, we're going to do the same survey here in the beginning of December, talking about you know their, their willingness and their, their um, fears about volunteering for next year. So thank you for that survey as well. It's outstanding. Esther Mitchell, you have a comment. Yes, at the University of Maryland Extension Master Gardener, we have five sub programs under our um, major program. They are Baywise, which is the stormwater management that teach residents about um, best management practices for curb and runoff, stormwater runoff, we have pollinators to teach them about pollinators, how to recognize pollinators in their various states and um, what not to use if you want a pollinator garden. We also have Ask the Master Gardener Clinic that teach, that answer question and provide um, best management practice <laughs> solutions for um, problems that residents have. We have composting. That is our entire recycling program that goes beyond composting. Um, we have native plants where we are encouraging more residents to plant native plants mm -hmm. and to use them more effectively in what they do. And then we have our Grow It, Eat It program, which is our vegetable, where we're trying to get 1 million or more residents to grow at least one vegetable that they can um, eat. A lot of people think they can't grow anything. And we have a program where we um, show them how to grow uh, just one simple vegetable. And from there, they just take off and they have a whole garden by the time we hear from them next. Sure. Well, thank you for that, Esther. And I will ask everybody to run all those projects that Esther just mentioned by this statement, educating residents on safe, effective, and sustainable horticultural practices that build healthy gardens, landscape, and community. And Esther, I would contend that all of those projects indeed support that mission statement. So that's great, great comments. All right, uh, let me go on. In Nevada, there is an effort underway to unify statewide efforts as an extension master gardener programs. It's been two separate operations, different training, different expectations. Hope is to basic use it, unify basic training level one. Um, and I am familiar with Nevada, so that's good. That's nice to see that you guys are bringing that all together. So let me go on with this and then we'll continue with some discussion. So you can see this is a web and uh, in terms of Marissa, in terms of the graphic, I'm not sure how good the graphic is because you know how when you're doing uh, animation, you're trying to get everything in the right lines, um, but it is a web. It is a, a wicked web at some times, but it is a web that when one falls, the others fall. So you have to keep all of these up in the air, keep that web woven at all times. Um, so you have to strive for excellence in all you do. And the thing we sometimes, I think sometimes we forget in the Master Gardener program, at least I know sometimes I find myself 
doing this, all the parts of this program are aligned for that success, that credibility, that successful fundraising, um, recruiting, recruiting the right people for your program, the people that get the mission, and then the training, the mission is aligned with the university mission and their orientation. Do they get you? Do they understand why you are doing what you are doing? They need to know that mission the very first day. They need to know what the university, they need to know they're part of a bigger picture in the university. So it starts way in the beginning with recruiting and training. And then of course that training goes on and on. And we know they all love the Hort content, but there's additional training that needs to be done in terms of leadership, fundraising, development, and so forth. Um, and then avoiding mission creep. As I mentioned, just, just watch that mission. It's so powerful to be able to say to a club or an organization that says, hey, can you guys come landscape my church? Well, that doesn't fit within our mission, but you know what? We're gonna do a workshop and you can attend or we can do the workshop at your site and teach you how to landscape, teach you how to plant. Just like Esther said, in terms of teaching them how to grow vegetables. And when I, I mentioned seek help, um, I don't mean that mental help because you can't say no, but the help at the <laughs> university. Sometimes I think we get into the counties and we forget that there are other resources out there. We're not on campus as some people might be. Uh, we forget that development exists out there. And in Ohio, at least, development has always been about 4-H. It, it's always been, let's raise funds for 4-H because it is easy to say, hey, we've got a children's garden. You put a ton of money into the children's garden. But if you say, well, we're doing sidewalks for this whole public garden, uh, that's just not as fun to give to as giving to a children's garden. So working with development on campus has done just, I mean, it's been huge for me. And I've been bugging them constantly saying, look, we got this program, we got this project. It takes time for them to get to know you. And we now have a really good relationship where they're willing to come out and they're willing, in fact, the $100,000 I got from the Wingert Tossey Pavilion was through the development uh, program or development department because this particular donor wanted to make sure they got their football ticket points for the president's fund. So having that option as a university was a great tool because otherwise they may not have given. They were, they were given $100,000 to the university over four years anyways. But now I just said, let's hijack that for this project as opposed to going to the athletic department. So the development um, organization in your college or your university can be a huge help. Along with other people, you know, when it comes to fundraising, I'm not a fundraiser, but I have learned by working with other people. Most importantly, my take home message to you folks um, is get involved. I have been around since 1992. And if anybody has been in extension longer than me, put your years up there. Cause most of you I know are very young or newer in extension. Um, there's not a lot of us old dogs still around. Um, so I've, I've watched over a period of time and I've learned um, the, the key components that have made me and allowed me to be successful in raising money for this garden. And I'm not telling you this to brag. I'm telling you this because if only I would have known this stuff 10, 15 years ago, I might even be further ahead than I am today. Um, so most importantly, get involved. Community efforts, remember that slide I said, remember this slide? It takes a lot of time on your part to develop those relationships. And yes, absolutely, it's time you don't have. When you look at you know, one board has monthly meetings every month for two hours, and then you're on three boards times two hours a month times two, you know, it gets to be time consuming. But the benefits of me being involved in those boards and involved in those community efforts and involved on those committees for the strategic planning has resulted in a lot of doors being opened, a lot of paths being paved for me. Uh, I would never ever have dreamed I would have gotten this much money donated to our project. And right now, between Master Gardeners raising money and us raising money with extension, it's a partnership. We've probably raised over $750,000 for this project to date. Um, so that credibility, that, that reputation got us to where we were today to allow us to ask for that kind of money. Um, and, and again, with community efforts, make sure they're aligned with your mission. You know, there are, pro there are organizations out there that may be your passion in terms of your volunteer passion to give back to your community, but I tried to align mine, those that I got involved with, with my program, with my extension program, so that when I was doing these meetings, they all benefited me personally and professionally. 
Same thing with community organizations. You know, you may not have time to be a Kiwanis volunteer or, or Rotary volunteer, but by going to speak to them, they now know about our program. They're always asking every year for somebody to speak about what's the latest insect problem? What's this? What's the? So put yourself out there and, and speak to them about the various horticulture topics. Right now, the great thing people are looking for is the social, mental, physical health benefits of gardening. And with COVID, it's made it really great because we can present to these organizations virtually and really talk about the value and benefits of gardening um, in general. Uh, Mike, you're saying insert request to submit resource. Oh, gotcha. Gotcha what you're doing. Um, and then also get to know your commissioners, your city council, however your city, your county, however that's set up. We have commissioners, some have councils. Get to know them and learn what their initiatives are. We have been working with our commissioners. They did a strategic plan and we have made sure that our extension efforts tie in to that strategic plan. Because if we're helping them meet their goals, their mission in the community, then we're gonna more, be more likely to get funded. But if we're doing things that don't match and don't, don't go alongside their strategic plan, they're gonna look at that and say, I'm not really sure you know, if, if this money needs to go here. Um, or there's strategic initiatives. We have a, and I think everybody across the country does, but you might check into this, a community health plan. Communities are required in Ohio to provide their community health plan, what their major issues are, tobacco cessation, drug use, and so forth. Well, one of our community health initiatives is obesity. Well, guess what? How many programs, how many projects can we get involved in in terms of that particular area. So we're looking at being aligned with our county and county commissioners. And again, put yourself out there. Um, the more people you know, the bigger your circle, the bigger your network and the bigger your circle of influence gets. So while those of you who are on here who are in your young stages of your careers, get involved, get, get in line with your community organizations, join one if you have to, Volunteer on your own if you have to, but they get to know you. They get to know your reputation, your credibility. And alongside with that, they get to know extension. Uh, and actually in Clark County, and I kind of let it go at that. They're like, oh, you're with the Master Gardeners. So they recognize the Master Gardeners and what they have done and we have done as an organization as opposed to so much extension. But we always say OSU extension, Master Gardener Volunteers, so let them know it's a partnership. Uh, but they do now know in our community what the master gardeners do. So in summary, what does success look like for your extension master gardener program? Uh, again, this graphic may not be the perfect graphic, but it is helpful to understand that these are all intertwined, fundraising development, mission statement, projects, credibility, reputation. All these things are important. And the more you build that bottom level of reputation and credibility, the easier that fundraising and that development is for those projects. So with that, I'd like to open it up to either questions or comments or thoughts about um, some of the things that you're doing in your communities, individual communities, uh, counties, or state coordinators and some of the things like Marissa was talking about that you're trying to encourage uh, for your counties. And I'm assuming, Nicole, that the chat box is being okay right now. Yes, you do have a few comments and questions. Okay. You want to, let's see, where do I start? I would start with, um, I think, uh, who was the most recent one? How about Heather uh, and then Beret? When I yes. took this job, I found that there were many Master Gardener volunteer yes. projects in existence that don't meet our educational mission. Some volunteers just maintain gardens for their organizations. They don't have an educational focus. However, they've been doing this project for 20 years. It's very hard to sunset them. Our approach is to try to encourage them and add educational comments. Many have started with signs and markers. It's a very slow pro process. Our new projects now have MOUs that outline the roles, ex expectations of partner organizations. So this doesn't happen in the future. And Beret, what I find in Ohio, and I'm sure this is true across the country, when a new educator takes the job of somebody who's been around a while, um, there are some changes that are going to occur and there might be some people quit the program. Um, and those, you know, those mission driven projects are the ones that are gonna be sustainable. 
and getting that group to turn that ship around and say, hey, this is a great project. You know, you're taking care of this garden, but how does it meet our mission of education? So you're already doing that with signage and so forth. Um, I did a program, I think, Nicole, is that the program I still owe you the recording for, but I, I'm not sure, getting ahead by letting go? Or yes. do you have that recording? I, I don't I, think I have that one. I owe you a recording though. There's a program that's an old, old, old extension program based out of, uh, I think it was Minnesota, um, about getting ahead by letting go. And it talks about the quadrants, those things that are, are essential, but they're you know old programs, but you still have to do them. Um, kind of doing that evaluation of those programs and involving your volunteers in those evaluations, involving them, getting them um, so that when you actually do have these discussions, um, you know, let, let them be involved in it. Let them say, hey, this, this is great. This one is a great program. We must keep it. But this one, well, yeah, it doesn't fit our mission. So that is a challenge. But uh, starting in that right direction with the new projects, you know, if somebody doesn't like the direction you're going, you're new, you're taking a different direction, kindly ask them to take their time, talents, and treasures, you know, to another organization that they feel is better aligned for them. And that's a hard, that's a hard ask. That's a hard ask. And they will do that eventually if they don't believe in the direction you're going. Kirsten says her challenge is getting enough volunteers to try new projects or expand existing ones we live in, shall we say, an opportunity-rich environment mission creep is real. Yeah, it sure is. And Particularly, we've noticed it with COVID, you know, what are those things that we really can do and do well? And instead of doing everything for everybody, let's really focus on those projects that we can do well. So that, that's a, a great statement, Kirsten. Beret, uh, Julie Hill is in the process in Wisconsin. Uh, Heather says, Beret, yes, same here. The most physically active volunteers are least interested in taking further continuing education to learn best practices and least interested in actually teaching others. The MGs who take lots of CE classes often don't turn up for projects, just social events. COVID has greatly reduced our numbers. Um, and I would contend that some of this goes back to that recruiting and training. You know, when you're recruiting, emphasizing the fact that this is a volunteer program, we have these other options if you just want to learn about horticulture. But this is about volunteering. This is about giving back to the community. So really emphasizing that whole piece. When I first started in extension, we had uh, extension educators here in Ohio that were just training to be training. I mean, Kentucky or Kentucky, Hamilton County, which is near Kentucky, they were training 500 volunteers a year, but they weren't keeping the volunteers. They were just doing the classes and getting the money. Well, that's not master gardener volunteer programming. That is horticulture training. So really looking at that recruiting piece uh, to recruit those volunteers. Uh, if you can share project MOUs, Kirsten says revamp all of our projects, including deliver deliverables. Somebody did, Mike, I think I saw you answered on how to get things to the resource library. Nicole, can you share documents via the listserv? So if we can, if we can get the document um, uh, that Marissa, said she had, that would be really helpful. Um, yeah, Marissa, if you want to email that to me, uh, I can send it out with the recording too. And then we can also uh, post it to the listserv and in the resource repository. Absolutely, yeah, I'd be happy to do that, Nicole. And I think I did submit um, part, of, part of this work um, as a potential talk for the 2021 um, series. So if folks are interested right. in learning more, maybe, maybe um, Maybe we'll be able to schedule that. But either way, I'm happy. I'm happy to share and get it up there. So I'll email too. Thanks. That's great. Thank Marissa. You. That'd be a great tie-in to some of these talks that we've been having. Um, so Beret said in a statewide position, that's a little harder to do. Um, it is Beret, but in your own community where your state's or your, your your university's located is something you can do personally. And then look at any statewide organizations like the Nursery and Landscape Association? Are there uh, trade associations? The um, Garden Clubs of Ohio, Ohio Garden Clubs Associations. Me being involved in them at the state level has been extremely helpful. I happen to be very fortunate or crazy. Uh, I'm in a county and at the state, I'm 50% each. So having that opportunity, it gets me involved at the county level, but I also then am getting involved at the state level. Uh, Mike, thank you for putting that in. You're welcome, Kirsten. Mike had to go. 
Uh, to avoid mission creep, we have an application process for new projects, and the project must show that it has willing volunteers and demonstrate sustainability before it can be added to our official list and receive a budget line. That's great, Sharon, but those kinds of things are, are absolutely essential to make sure you don't have that mission creep. So anybody else have questions or comments that they want to provide? We are right at four minutes left. I have a couple of comments. Um, so I thought we had done a really great job in my county of aligning what we're doing with our mission, especially over time since I uh, started working with volunteers and trying to avoid that mission creep. But COVID has really thrown a monkey wrench in things because it's interesting how much more we were able to clear off the calendar because of COVID but it's also causing additional demands where we're going to need to pivot quite a bit next year. And as Marissa alluded to, I see us doing more with less volunteers because of the situation. So it's just a, a different environment. Um, but I do think this is a really great time to talk about this, to think about our trajectory for next year. Um, and then I also wanted to just point out, make sure to share your mission statement with the volunteers too, because sometimes um, they need to be reminded at least annually, if not more frequently of the mission. And one of the things that um, I'm going to be doing next year is developing that leadership, explaining more of you know the reporting that we do, letting them know how that all links to the organization a little bit better and how it goes back to the mission statement. So. I thought these were great tips and points. I especially appreciated your point, Pam, about starting even with recruitment and training of volunteers, but that's super important as well. Yep, absolutely, yep. And, and I'll, I'll close with um, alluding to your comment that you know, repeating that mission or repeating that mission vision, make sure they know their connection to the university. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Knaus is in Pennsylvania and this was before her time. And so Nancy, this is not referring to you by any means. We uh, got a new director, a new dean, Bruce McFerrin, who came from Penn State. And he started going around the state and talking to people when he came to my county and started talking about the Master Gardener program. We talked about the state program because he knew I was state program director. But he said, you know, what I've learned in Ohio is that your Master Gardeners have a much stronger connection to the university than they did in Pennsylvania. And now Nancy, again, that was before you got there. That was many years ago because he's now moved on to the vice provost or whatever he is now. But I think it is very important that our volunteers know that they're part of the university. Again, they're maintaining the university's reputation. You know, you've got a university reputation to uphold. So Nicole, your point about all the time talking about it, what's our mission, going over it yearly. And again, in that training, that training should, the first day of class should be orientation. Here's our mission, here's our vision, here's how we're connected to the university. You are now a Buckeye, um, you know, following that up on a regular basis so they understand. So that's a great point to make, Nicole. But um, Pamela, I must say the university also must recognize that the Master Gardener program is part of them as well. So many times they think it's just a, nice to have program that can be dispensed of when, with budget cuts. Yeah. But I think they need to start taking an invested interest in us as well as we need to take an invested interest in them. Absolutely, Esther. I couldn't agree more. And with that, I am meeting with our dean Friday afternoon for 15 minutes. She had open um, office hours for people. And um, she let people sign up, any faculty, any members could sign up to talk to her for 15 minutes. Of course, you never get that opportunity. You know, when the dean comes to visit your county, it's just like, ah, you know, you don't get that opportunity to talk. And so they also asked, what did you want to talk to her about? And I said, elevating the status of the Master Gardener Volunteer Program in the college, not, not just, you know, we give this many hours, we give this much food and so forth, but getting people to understand the value of our program master. So that's exactly where I'm going Friday. That's my next step on the internal side of that, that connection. And Nancy says, and we'll wrap that up here. Nicole, Nancy says she's familiar with that comment and we have worked hard to establish a strong connection with the university and it does take work, but it, it can be done. So thank you everybody for your time. I really appreciate yes, it. Thanks everyone. This yep. was great. Thank you, Pam. I learned a lot. I look forward to seeing the resources that folks can share as a result of this, this talk. Um, I look forward to some of our presentations next year, and I really appreciate everyone's time today. So great discussion. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys.
Have a great holiday. All right. Everyone else too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.